Thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name is James Kitfield. I'm the senior uh, national security and foreign affairs correspondent here in Washington for National Journal Magazine. Um, I was called into my friends here from Rumi because I've written a fair amount about Turkey in the last year and over the years. Uh, I'm actually here, like most of you, to learn from these gentlemen because I actually think that Turkey is one of the most interesting and important geopolitical questions out there today. Uh, it's clearly a country that's being transformed, even before our eyes. Um, the nature of that transformation, I think, is one that's very important to the United States and to all Turkey's friends and uh, all of its neighbors in the region. Um, clearly, there is divergent narratives about how that transformation is heading. Some, some worry that the compliant Turkey of the past, who was sort of our little brother in NATO, is uh, tilting to the east. Others um, would argue that Turkey is just assuming its place as a regional power, as it gains power and its economy takes off. Um, some worry that Turkey is tilting more towards an authoritarian model. Um, others say it's just going through the growing pains of a more vibrant democracy. Um, I'm very interested to hear what my um, colleagues up here have to say because I think how Turkey handles press freedoms will be a very key early indicator about which fork in the road Turkey takes. Is it going to become more democratic as it becomes more powerful? Um, or are there signs that it will become more, more authoritarian, less democratic? And this, all of these questions are extremely more important after the Arab Spring because there are a lot of uh, countries in the Middle East who are looking to Turkey and especially the um, ruling party, which is a religiously based but party in a democratic Turkish secular society as a model for their own transformation. So as Turkey goes, May the region, the, the region may also go, and I think that makes Turkey's transformation all the more important. So to talk about press freedoms in Turkey, I'm going to first introduce um, Mr. Salih Memican. Memican. Memican, I'm sorry, Memican, who is a cartoonist at Sabah newspaper and the president of the Media Association of Turkey. He's going to talk for 10 minutes or so, and then I'm going to go down the, the line here, and then we'll take questions after the three presenters are finished. Please. OK, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, yes, Turkey is changing, and I think it's changing for better. It's becoming a more democratic society, and Turkey is not going tilting towards is or or tilting towards a, a civilian dictatorship or things like that. And as journalists, we are in a position to feel that better change in the society more than in other profession because. We started to discuss and write about the things which were quite uh, difficult to write, let's say, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You know, when we think about it, it was even hard to write or impossible to write the word Kurd in a newspaper 20 years ago. Now we discuss whether Kurdish people should have autonomy or uh, they should be taught at their schools in their main town mother tongue and things like that and whether we should change the the names of the villages and places to Kurdish. Now that's a big improvement. Also we started to discuss recently uh, not only within the journalistic society but also within the overall the large society what happened in 1915. You know how you know how did all those Armenians got killed, and what's behind it? Who did that? Why, why it happened, and what we, what did we do as a bigger society about this so far? And also, we start to discuss about the uh, limitations put on religious people. You know, how come they didn't have the full rights to teach religion to their children? So, why, why was it like that? So. And how come there is no, I mean, we don't send those women with headscarves to universities? We start to discuss that. And we came out with some solutions uh, uh, for some of them. But still, you know, women with headscarf, for instance, can go to universities, but cannot be hired as government officers, which would be unthinkable here in, in the United States. So we have some issues. Okay, in terms of uh, journalistic uh, problems, now uh, 
We had military coups in Turkey. It's a tradition. We used to have military coups in every 10 years. And we, we realized that we had ten, in every 10 years uh, military coups, but we didn't realize that there were preparations of it continuously. I mean, in every two years. <coughs> so, so only it happened in 10 years. And military coup, I don't know if you know, it, it was bad. Not only bad after it happened, but in order it to happen, you know, you had to prepare, prepare the public so that they would want a military coup to happen. In order to do that, they killed journalists here and their famous journalists, and you know, they write, they create chaotic environment for it. So we journalists used to be killed, and I remember 15 years ago, I got a gun, you know. Now I, I'm thinking about it right now as a cartoonist. Why should, how come I bought a gun? But I did buy a gun. And my friends, especially who were editor in chiefs or you know, at higher up positions or uh, famous columnists, they, they had their cars armored. You know, those were the times that we came to this stage and so on. And after the military coups, usually what happens is, you know, you get in the jail, you know, and, you know, get fired, things like that. You know, in order to give an explain, I just um, recently thought about that. In 1972, I was a college student in Ankara. So I was, I was to go to Kızılay. It's a district in Ankara from Bahçelievler. So I got into a dolmuş, which is a carpool, you know, public transportation. So it's a like Kızılay dolmuş, dolmuş going to Kızılay. And a military officer got in on the way, got into the car and said, OK, we are going to Ulus. But this is a Kızılay dolmuş. I said, we are going to Ulus. So we, we all went to Ulus. <laughs> so that's how they manage the things when the military coups happened in Turkey. Well, nowadays, as I said, we, had, we don't have the threat of military coups because now, you know, the recent attempt to coups are revealed and they are being judged. And, you know, some of them, some of the generals who were thought to be involved in, in planning stages are in jail. And also, there are some journalists who are accused of being in the planning stage are also in jail. <coughs> we don't know whether they are involved or not. It's in the judiciary process right now. But does this mean that we don't have a freedom of expression problem in Turkey? We do. That's basically because of the understanding of judges and prosecutors uh, what's freedom of expression or how they approach the uh, issue. We have state at one end, we have people on the other hand, and judges usually take side with the state and state ideology. So if it's your freedom of expression versus counter-terrorism, you know, most probably you are, you know, you will be accused of terrorism and you'll be, you know, detained or put on the court. So we have some a vague line between what is terrorism and what's freedom of or what is supporting terrorism and what is um, covered with freedom of expression. So I believe that there may be some journalists who are in jail or detained in Turkey who wouldn't be here in America, but it's not in hundreds. There are several, I believe, and I believe that there are some journalists who are in jail because what they wrote, not related to terrorism, but you know, other things, for instance, Ergenekon case. We have this Ergenekon case, which is the uh, trail of, trial of uh, um, people who were planning a coup. And again, some journalists are involved in that. They, they are accused of and they are on trial. Some of them are in detention. And that obviously, we are waiting to see you know, with what their involvement were. But you know, before I finish this part of my talk, 
yes, we are doing better in terms of freedom of expression, human rights, and other issues in Turkey in terms of democracy, but we still have issues, and as a media association, we are lobbying for it, for, for it to be better. Okay. <coughs> it's obviously, a, uh, if I would summarize, I would say a, a pretty optimistic, if cautiously optimistic, right. assessment of where the transformation right. is going, and uh, it's, that's good to hear. Um, next uh, presenter will be Ergen Babahan, a columnist for the Star newspaper, and today Zaman, and a commentator for 24 TV. Please, sir. Change uh, is good or bad. It depends on where you look at it from. Uh, the ending of slavery in the S United States was good for blacks or those who believe it was good f uh, for the human equality or those who needed labor, the industrialists. Uh, it was good, but it wasn't that good for the slave owners or the farmers in the South. So it caused so many problems. Uh, we are uh, having uh, the same kind of problem in Turkey. Uh, majority of people in Turkey were treated like black people uh, during the slavery time in Turkey. They thought the people were primitive, not enough Western or not well educated, so they needed the shepherds to teach them how to think, how to dress, how to live, even how to pray. Now, uh, it was maybe successful for mm -hmm. a certain period of time, but time changed, and now there is a strong middle class in Turkey. And they want to have a higher say uh, for their lives and how their country is run, how their uh, daily lives are arranged, how their kids had, uh, have what kind of education. And the old system is resisting it, very frankly. That's why we are uh, witnessing so many military coup attempts. Also, some <coughs> false accusations, trying to uh, a perception among the, uh, uh, some uh, bureaucratic class or the upper middle class of Turkey, uh, trying to tell them that Turkey is going to be a Malaysia or there is a civilian dictatorship in Turkey, or Turkey is changing its course, course toward the east, leaving the west, totally. Uh, these are baseless, but uh, when you are fighting a political war, the, the, uh, these are legitimate. You might question or even make false statements about the power, but when it comes to uh, trying to bring it down in cooperation with the military, it's unacceptable. And uh, unfortunately, some uh, people in Turkey just tried to do that. And inclu that includes also the mainstream media. Uh, media got its biggest power and richness f uh, at first in 1960 Q, military Q. Then, uh, they became a part of this huge uh, apparatus. They served the interest of the military. They write what military asked them to write. And they didn't touch sensible issues uh, involving our recent history. Didn't question the f uh, re foundation of the republic. Let's say, we, uh, as Salih mentioned, we didn't see the Kurdish problem, or we didn't see the Arbaker prison where thousands of people were tortured or killed uh, in unthinkable ways. It was the same for Armenian issue. We didn't know that there were Armenians living in Turkey once upon a time, and then they disappeared. And we realized that we have a, such a problem through the killings of Turkish diplomats in the West. But still, we couldn't discuss it openly. Uh, when some people, it was also a taboo subject in the academia also. When uh, there was a professor in Turkey, Ismail Beşikçi, wrote about Kurdish issues, uh, they present them for nearly 25 years of his life while spent in prisons. Or some journalists try to write about that kind of subjects or 
dirty business of the state, then they were killed. Uh, so your life was also in danger. Uh, they claim that we are under pressure. It's true, Turkey doesn't have the perfect liberal democracy now. But we are trying to reach that point. We witnessed the last killing of a political journalist in Krant case, uh, Dink case. After that, uh, his real killers were caught, brought to justice, but we couldn't manage the ones who ordered his execution. But still, it was a good thing. When you have the real people who committed the crime, uh, it makes people to think twice. So since we don't <coughs> see any other murders, it's a great relief for journalists who write on very sensitive matters. So in, uh, from this point of view, it's very uh, free country now, Turkey. You can write anything you wish to. But uh, we have a very strong, powerful government, a very strong leader in Turkey. And they have been in power for 10 years. So it might cause some problem with media. And it's uh, what we sometimes are witnessing in Turkey. Uh, but also the media ownership, the mainstream media are owned by different uh, businessmen who have higher interest than in their mining businesses, energy businesses, or banking businesses than in journalism. They try to use the media to make the government, the president, happy and so they can get contracts from the government in other fields. Uh, that's the uh, structure of uh, media, the main problem in Turkey, more than the limits to freedom of expression or the freedom of media. If you're, and uh, keep in mind that the editorial uh, independence is very limited in Turkey. The last say belongs to the owner, so it creates problem for journalists doing their job. The other thing, as Salis told, uh, it's the judiciary. They are very status uh, when it comes to freedom of expression or freedom of media. Uh, they uh, take sight on the security of state or the existence of state. If they think what you write or what you do is a threat to the existence or the security of the state, they take part on the side of the state. Uh, most uh, majority of the judges in Turkey do not know or speak a foreign language, so they don't follow the decisions or verdicts of the European Human Rights Court. So they do actually, according to the constitutions, Turkish constitutions, uh, their verdicts are superior to our uh, constitution, but they don't obey it. When uh, it comes to their decisions, they are become very restrictive. Uh, they don't know the real world, actually. They live in a close community. So it's not easy to change this atmosphere in Turkey because of the structure uh, of the judiciary. We need maybe uh, 10, 20 years. Need, uh, we need new trained, educated judges who understand that they serve the justice, not the state. Uh, but it will take time to be able to do that. That's one of the biggest problem. Uh, each government likes, uh, the, uh, more normally, p politicians do not like critics. It's same in Turkey. Uh, but if you are critical of the government, uh, as some people uh, claim, it doesn't uh, cause you go to the prison or something else. We are, uh, in Turkey, we are different than the United States. We have all national newspapers and we have about 40 something newspapers selling. Some of them are selling close to 1 million. Some of them are selling 30, 40,000 copies a day. But we have Kurdish or nationalist, ultra nationalist, anti AK party uh, publications also. And they are freely printed, sold, read, uh, even on internet and different uh, outlets. So it's not just. Uh, the expression of freedom is very limited in Turkey. There are problems because of the ownership structure of the mainstream media. That's the most uh, important thing, in my opinion. 
And if uh, there is a foreign investment in Turkish media, which is very possible, uh, we expect that in April, uh, News Corp or Time Warner are going to be a, one of them is going to be a partner or the owner of the second biggest Turkish media organization in Turkey, which is Sabah and ATV, ATV uh, which helps for a better uh, ethics, uh, professional uh, discipline, editorial independence. We expect that the foreign investment, as it happened in the banking system or uh, automobile industry or uh, drug companies, will help the rise the quality of the profession and will break the relation, direct business relation with the government, with Ankara. So we people will try to make newspapers to be successful, to make money on it, not just uh, using it as a leverage to making money f through other uh, fields. That's probably good, Eric, and we'll <laughs> go along and we'll just go into the questions then. So Dennis has kindly given me permission not to mangle his last name. Um, <laughs> he's the Secretary General of the Media Association of Turkey and he's a blogger and uh, hopefully we'll hear something about how social media and internet yeah play into this new dynamic in Turkey. Yeah, thank you, James. Well, I'm a freelance technology writer, so I would like to discuss the issue in terms of technology too. But before I begin my conversation, I would like you to, and also the audience as well, to think about, you know, what is the, the most important invention of our generation? What might be, I mean, laptops, or iPods, or iPhones, or mobile phones maybe. I, mean, I think the most important invention of our generation is the internet. Sorry? Uh, uh, okay. The, the internet uh, has been the most uh, important invention of our generation, I believe, uh, because it has changed how we communicate with each other, how we consume news, how we shop, how we find our soulmates, even, how we define our relationships. I think the internet uh, was the, the most important. And, and looking at the Arab Spring movements and even the London riots that have occurred a few months ago in England, uh, we see that the internet is playing a very important uh, role. So the influence of the internet has spread beyond the online uh, life and it's, it's affecting our own lives too. So I when, when talking about the, the press freedom issue, freedom of expression issues in Turkey, I would like to share with you some statistics about you know how is Turkey in terms of internet statistics okay. and what might we think about where the country is headed to. So when we look at the statistics, uh, the online population in Turkey, we see that Turkey is the 13th largest uh, online community uh, uh, in, in the world and the fifth uh, largest in Europe. Uh, Turkey has a population of 74 million people and with an average age of 28 years. Um, and the internet population of the whole country is 35 million. So which makes uh, almost more than 45% of internet penetration in the in, in the country and this makes turkey the fifth biggest uh, internet population in Euro europe after uh, germany russia uk and france so 70 percent of the whole online users are also this is quite important are younger than 30 34 years it's a very young population also on amongst the, the online users um, according to comscore turkish internet users also have the third largest engagement in europe they're quite familiar with the, the internet and uh, the average Turkish internet user spends almost 32 hours in a month. And broadband subscribers also, uh, it's quite important. There are, in, in 2003, there were only 18,000 uh, broadband subscribers, but now we have almost 13 million uh, internet broadband subscribers in Turkey. And there are almost 65 million mobile phones, or near to 6 million people uh, access internet through their mobile phones. And Turkey is also um, the fifth largest country on Facebook with 31 million uh, Facebook users. Um, and, and not only on Facebook, uh, the Turkish online users are, are also very active on the other social media platforms. 96% uh, of the whole Turkish online uh, population is, uh, is using uh, the, these social media tools. 
And we are the number one country on front feed and the number eight country on Twitter. And when we talk about Twitter in Turkey, I think it has become uh, an important uh, playground for oppositional ideas, I think. For example, uh, these uh, few months ago, we had a very bad uh, earthquake in the one in the east uh, part of Turkey in Van, and many people actually learned uh, what has happened on on in Van from the Twitter first. I mean, before these all major media outlets, before all these newspapers, people learned what was happening there from the tweets of the locals. They started tweeting about or, or sending some photos. And then people started to discuss what we could do. And then, you know, in Turkey, we have this famous saying, when there is a big bad thing happened, we always say, or we like to say, where is the state? So this time, it was, I think, the first time that people started to ask, where are the corporations, not the state? Where are these corporations that they are selling water to us? Why don't they s send some water to, to one? Or these um, blanket producers, for example, blanket fa fa uh, factories. Why don't, don't they send some some blankets to one mm. or to airline companies? Why don't they put some additional flights? So they push the companies to to help the, the people. And some people also, <coughs> a, a senior journalist in Turkey, he himself initiated a project, a social project. He, he's calling Evim Evinder One, uh, which means in English that my house is your house one. So he invited, he, he personally invited, he said that, you know, I want to invite a family from one and he, they can stay in my house. So people liked the idea and he put a hashtag on it, like Evim Evinder one, and then people started to retweet about it and there were like almost 500 families inviting people from one. So it became like a social phenomenon. So I think Twitter is also playing a very active role and I must also underline the, 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 the important statistic that the most followed person in Turkey is the Turkish president Abdullah Gül with, with almost 1.5 million followers and he's uh, updating his, his Twitter account regularly. Uh, I gave this example because I think you know it's the president of Turkey so I think it's also important to, to, to see how the, 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 the country officials are also you know uh, sure. Thinking about the social media as well. <coughs> so uh, also in in terms of the e-commerce, uh, Turkey in 2010 had almost 10 billion dollars of e-commerce, which is quite small actually for when we think about uh, the American market. But it's quite big for us because in uh, between 2006 and 2010, the e-commerce market has grown more than 300 percent. And in 2011, in the first half, we had already 10 billion dollars. So it's quite big, and people are really familiar with uh, with e-commerce as well. But when we talk about the internet, you know, not everything is quite like you know positive as well. But there are some counterpoints too. You know, <coughs> these counterpoints. One of them, I think, um, the, the internet law that we have. According to some statistics, there are almost 5,000 websites are banned in Turkey. Um, and these websites are banned uh, due to some actually complex regulations and, mm -hmm. and separation of power. So some courts decide to ban a website. But then again, we must uh, underline a, an important fact that 90% of all these websites are pornographic uh, websites, which might be also related to child porno pornography issues. But then again, some, some web, uh, there are Again, I mean, like 5,000 uh, pages are banned in Turkey, and they might be banned until 2010. YouTube was banned as well uh, because of uh, defamation of Atatürk, or because of a video. But uh, in 2010, the, the ban was lifted. And there is also one interesting point here is that during those, I think uh, YouTube was banned for like, like three years in Turkey, or two or three years. During this period, it's quite interesting that according to Alexa statistics, where they you know, measure these, uh, these internet statistics, uh, it was quite interesting to see that YouTube was uh, amongst the most, visit, most 10 visited websites in Turkey. How? Because the, the young population of Turkey, they knew how to handle the things on, on the background. How to know? get around it. Yeah, just like, yeah. you know, uh, so they, they, we, we used proxy servers. We, yeah. we used open DNS servers, which was quite easy. You know, just you were just clicking some numbers and that was it. So all these bans, all this censorship <coughs> was just like left meaningless. So people also are also, you know, adapting quite fast to technology, technological advancements. Okay. And the other thing is that, you know, it quite also uh, raised some concerns. The, the internet safety mm. program that was announced uh, late last uh, uh, November, it raised some concerns, but then again, the government had to, the government or the authorities, internet authorities had to change it and they make it 
as, a, as an optional choice, not a mandatory choice, but as an optional choice because people demanded some internet filters as well. So, as a conclusion, I believe that Turkey is, a, is, is, is one of the hardest places for the, the internet, for the digital market in the world. And, and many users, uh, we love to spend time on social media. Um, the young population is also is affecting the usage of technology. We are uh, quite fast on adapting new technologies. Um, and Turkish internet users are quite hungry for quality offerings in the, in the internet. And the most important thing, I think, the high penetration numbers of internet in Turkey shows us that our country, I mean, Turkey, is now a more vibrant, more open, and, and a more democratic society in terms of internet. Because when, if it's a country with 65 million mobile phones, mm -hmm. if it's a country of uh, 35 million people using the internet, and when uh, the, the, the social media penetration is almost 96%, when all the internet users are using, using social media, it cannot be a closed country. It cannot be a closed, you know, under curtains. It's just impossible uh, okay. to, to hide things anymore. So okay. uh, I believe that the internet, I'm on the positive side that, that the internet usage in Turkey will transform our uh, uh, Turkey for a positive future. Great, great. <coughs> well, I'm going to get to questions from the audience, and I have a couple of my, I'll start out with a couple of my, myself. I mean, what we've heard, you, you, you can see why I find t Turkey such a fascinating question mark. We've heard described here a society that's coming out of the long shadow of authoritarianism, where it was taboo to even talk about the most fundamental things, um, ethnic identity, religious symbols, whether the military's role in government, all of it taboo, all of it now on the table. It, it's going through this transformation at a time when the whole world's going through this internet revolution. So it's, it lends a dynamism to, we, to this change that we saw in the Arab Spring and we definitely are seeing in Turkey. Um, and, I, and I take my other colleague's point that um, for the most part, most Turks I've talked to think that the, it's a net plus, all these changes are sometimes difficult and they bring different constituencies into conflict with each other. Um, but at the same time, a net plus, things are getting better. Um, I wanted to start off with the, your, your, your point about the, the military coups because as an American, I must admit, during the Cold War, I've, I, I fell into this mindset that Ataturk gave the military the final authority to defend the secular nation, and when it was threatened by Islamism or whatever, th th these coups were in, s in some sense a good thing because they uh, guaranteed uh, Turkey's secular democratic uh, nature. You know, I have since come to understand that those were very dark periods preceded by very dark deeds. Um, more recently, we have seen a crisis where the chiefs of staff all resigned in, in, in unison. They feel that the old order is, is changing too fast, they're losing too much power too quickly. Um, in the old days, I think that would have been a military coup, but instead they decide to resign. Does this mean that a military coup is now part of your past, that it's not going to be part of your future? So Any one of you want to say? Okay. <laughs> yes, we thought that it, when military coup happened, we thought that it was a good thing because so that we won't become an Islamic nation. But now we realize that we never had that uh, threat anyway. We were presented as if we, we are under threat. Uh, otherwise, a coup wouldn't be justified. And we had these uh, the similar attempts recently, but we didn't believe it. Now, Turkish society became more open, and we became, we, you know, secularist. I mean, I consider myself among them, th uh, that group. We met with the other group, and we realized that they are very nice people, and they have intention of getting rich, being happy, and being secure. And we have the same things. So if we had more freedom of everything, then we would all be happy. And that's what's <coughs> happening, or we, we hope that that's what will be happening soon. But military coups were not needed, mm. were not required, and they caused terrible results. I mean, the 28th of February process, we call it was <coughs> kind of military coup, and Turkish people lost billions of dollars to crook businessmen. It was given to them by strong people, military governments, 
I mean, it worked like this. So in order to pave groundwork, in order to pave groundwork, you, you manipulate the press. When you manipulate the press, you create them, you give them advantages such as banking and so on. And then Turkish people lose. Yeah. The, um, so if military coups are, out of the, uh, are, are part of the past and not part of Turkey's future, um, the other side of that equation is you have a, a sort of religiously based party for the last 10 years, very successful in terms of its economic policies. The concern is that um, as you open up uh, to more overt use of religious symbols, the headscarf issue, et cetera, is that the, you know, you, you've heard the criticism. Some people think that he's got an agenda to sort of have a, an Islamist society, maybe with a democratic facade, but that's, he's got that, that's sort of the ultimate goal. Um, do you, do you, either of you buy that argument? If he uh, has an agenda, secret agenda, it's a well-kept secret. <laughs> he has been in power for 10 years, and if you look at the numbers, uh, in reality, the number of restaurants which serve alcohol should be increased, especially in Istanbul. The number of wine producing should uh, be increased also. Uh, they are living their best period uh, in Turkey, even with an Islamic government. Uh, I mean, uh, we t always were taught that if Islamic people get the higher say, we will be under uh, threat. Our life, way of life will be threatened. They won't allow you to drink alcohol or they will use, force your daughters, if they go to the university in Anatolian cities, to uh, uh, wear a headscarf. And uh, f fortunately, not legally, totally legally, but uh, they started going to the universities in the very small cities of Turkey nowadays, and they are going to the classes with girls without headscarves. So people <laughs> are seeing those things and don't pay attention much. Okay, and my last question before I open to the audience is um, the concern of many politicians in this town is that what, as we see this evolution in Turkey, we're seeing a tilt of Turkey towards the east. You've heard the argument. Um, and that, that will be a tilt away from a, a strong U.S.-Turkish relationship that's been a strategic anchor in that region for a long time. Um, is that concern valid? Dennis, why don't you answer that question in your mind? Well, I think, I mean, there's this always this, this debate like you know we had al always in, in, the, in the 90s we had the, the idea of that if Turkey would be a Sharia country and when we came to like you know beginning of 2000 we had the, the fear of if we are going to be a Malaysian country Malaysia and now then we had this you know civil dictatorship and now nowadays we are discussing that it's a country that is jailing all these journalists but on the, we, you know besides all these rumors and, and, and you know conspiracy theories Turkey is just moving away I mean uh, when we look at uh, the, the numbers and the relations, you know, I believe you know America, uh, United States, it's still a strong ally in Turkey. And when 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 we look at the region, you know, I think in my, my personal idea, Turkey is the unique country that that United States can sit down at the table and talk, uh, which is quite important because Turkey has these many years of institutions, and we are a member of NATO, you know. Uh, we are a member of UN, and then we have these this many organizations that we are linked to each other. So Turkey is, is, is I think, the most important country where <coughs> the U.S. officials, U.S., can sit down at the table and discuss issues in, in a civilized manner. Sure. Know? This is, and this is, I think, quite <coughs> important. And, and you didn't mention the EU accession process, but that's yes. been incredibly important. Yes. And, you know, I can say, f f from American perspective, <coughs> for all the concerns about a tilt to the east, you know, and, uh, a good neighbor policy that allowed Tur Turkey reached out to all its neighbors, Iran, Syria, etc. You know, as the situation has devolved in Syria or as in Libya, I mean, Turkey couldn't have been a, been a better ally and, and more in line with our thinking on these. So that's been a, that's been to me a very telling indication of the strategic uh, direction could be one that's very beneficial to America because we seem to think fundamentally on the same on the same path. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Please state your name and affiliation and limit it to a question, please. No political statements. We just want to um, involve our audience here in a, in a, in a discussion with these uh, learned colleagues. So I see a hand right there to start out with. I think there's a microphone coming to your right. 
هاي هاي شالب الانتون اي ليبانيز جورناليست Uh, I haven't heard the name of Erdogan with you when you're talking. Is he a red line for a journalist not to talk about or about his party? Uh, how, uh, how many uh, journalists are currently in jail? That's the question. What was the question? How many journalists in jail? And, and uh, you know, does Erdogan uh, come under criticism for putting journalists in jail, in some cases, for years without charges, which uh, as an American I find a bit troublesome? Yeah, I'm, I mentioned it a bit earlier. Uh, according to some statistics, they say it's 108 journalists. According to some other s statistics, it's just eight journalists. So it depends on what you consider, who you, who cons whom do you consider a journalist. Okay, there is a journalist <coughs> who are being tried in jail because he, he is caught with a bomb, and that's considered as a journalist in jail. And there is another one who is considered as a journalist who, are, who is supporting terrorism, which I would think should be covered as freedom of, within freedom of expression. Uh, uh, so it depends on how you see it. <coughs> but, uh, you know, you, you want to say other things about this? Who's con how many? Uh, we have a counterterrorism uh, uh, law. It is very problematic. It might put you into the shoes of a terrorist all of a sudden. So we need to change this. Uh, but still, if the judges can use it for freedom of express, they might uh, refrain from arresting people for uh, petty things. But uh, we have, as I mentioned, uh, we have a judiciary who is going after even the uh, chief of uh, intelligence apparatus, may even uh, thinking to arrest them. So we need a uh, deep reform in Turkish, Turkish judiciary <coughs> system. That's the problem. And, and to, just to reiterate, my understanding of the situation is, is that you know you have a country where free press is a new thing and there's a, and there's a constitution being written but there are no, there's no First Amendment in Turkey right. and you have a judiciary that leans towards instinctively the state. So when there's a dispute between a journalist and the state, I think maybe too frequently the judiciary is not sort of respecting the independent press, more respecting the, the needs of the state. Yes, about sorry Go about ahead. Mr. Erdogan's uh, actions. He's a from he's from northern galaxy where people are very uh, emotional and reactive, and I am from that part too. Is so what? Is he a red line you cannot speak about? No, no, he's, no, you can, there are so many cartoons, there are so many articles and so critical of him in Turkey. But uh, he speaks back to journalists, he gets upset, he gets angry, he goes up there and he talks back to journalists. And that's not a good thing, but you know, he, he, he's emotional, so. <laughs> and also keep in mind, if the owner of the media group is doing business with the government. When he answers back, he might think this guy is bad for my organization. That's the problem. More problematic. The, the, the comment I heard was yeah. that you know talking about Turkey's patriarchal society was that Erdogan was not too authoritarian. He's just too Turkish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, and then the woman in the second row. Uh, Michael Kurtzig, who used to spend quite a bit of time in Turkey and worked on Turkish agriculture and economics. I wonder, I'm, I'm rather pleased to hear what, what you said, but speaking of uh, Prime Minister Erdogan, has anyone written about the hypocrisy of his policies? And that is, he accuses Israel of genocide in, in uh, Gaza and so on and uh, fighting uh, the terrorists and yet freely bombs Kurds in Iraq with no problem, uh, of course defending Turkish principles and Turkish soil. I think it's quite a hypocritic po uh, uh, hypocritical. Hypocritic, hypocritical policy. If you write about that in Turkey, do you have problems in publishing? And do you hear from the government? Because one more thing, you said the government is very powerful. A powerful government should be able to tolerate quite a bit of dissension, but I don't hear that here. I hear quite a... Uh, control of the press. Thank you. Uh, when it comes to Kurdish issue, he was the first politician in Turkey as the prime minister 
went on TV and there was an incident in 1938 in a Kurdish town, eastern part of Turkey, call, we call it Dersim. Now, uh, after that incident, they changed its name to Tunceli, and he said the early republic committed a kind of genocide in this town, killing about 14,000 people. Uh, it was a first facing that kind of things, but when it comes to the northern Iraq problem, uh, Turkish military is not bombing Kurdish villages or civilians or kids and not using dangerous uh, bombs. They are targeting just uh, militants who come to Turkey and kill our soldiers. Who are uh, and uh, when they stop killing Turkish soldiers, uh, Turkish military operation stops also. Even inside to Turkey, there are four to five thousand uh, Kurdish militants in Turkey. And if there is no fight between Turkish military or they are not attacking uh, military camps or garrisons, the, they can uh, keep living in the mountains by themselves. That's a different point. From It's different Gaza and uh, eastern part of Turkey is a part of Turkey. We didn't occupy eastern part of Turkey. And also, you might have difficult time understanding how uh, you know military, uh, Israeli military, you know, kills civilians in Mavi Marmara. He may have difficult time understanding. Uh, and just on that point, you know, I, I, I can tell you that the you know the split over the the Gaza flotilla was a huge split between the U.S. and Ankara. Uh, um, Two things I will say. In, in drawing a hard line against Israel's um, behavior in Gaza, if you will, and spe especially going back to the war in 2008, Cass led, um, he's reflecting regional, a uh, very popular regional stance. So this has really increased his popularity. So being a politician, it plays it plays well to the street, and he's using he's milking that for whatever he can get out of it. Um, on, on, uh, in terms of the the Kurd situation, I learned this myself. He's given more political space to the Kurds than any previous Turkish leader. I would I would say, and by doing so, he's won himself a little bit of freedom of action when it comes to the PKK in Iraq, because domestically he's let him open it up to Kurdish language television stations. He's he's reached out to the Kurdish population in a way that hasn't. And it's pretty clever as a politician. He's he's bought himself, I think, some some uh, freedom of action in that. Um. But I asked if it was dangerous for them to write about everyone's politics. And I think they said no, right? Is um, it, can you write about uh, You can check my writings in English or also in Turkish. You can see uh, most of us are just doing that. in. Uh, not for his policy uh, towards Hatskar for other things, but towards Kurds or other uh, sensitive uh, there are, uh, actions. There are articles pro-Israel, you know, at, you know, criticizing Erdogan in Turkish press. The young woman in the uh, second row, please. <coughs> so we are here. Okay, yeah. sorry. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Daphne McCurdy with the Project on Middle East Democracy. Um, all the panelists spoke about the status of uh, democracy in Turkey in comparison to 20 years ago. And I think, you know, almost everyone is in agreement that Turkey is a much more democratic society than it was 20 years ago. But I, I wonder if you talked, you know, just about, I think what troubles a lot of people is that Turkey's less democratic than it was maybe five years ago. Um, and you know a lot of these reforms and the reformist seal of, of Erdogan um, that existed in 2002, 2003 um, is questionable now. Um, you know you mentioned the Kurdish issue and uh, Erdogan did uh, initiate the Kurdish opening but we haven't really seen any movement on that. Um, we, we are seeing journalists being arrested. Maybe you know they're not being killed, but you know compared to five years ago, I think that these are some troubling indications. So I just wondered if you talked um, by framing it in terms of you know where the AKP started and and where it is now. Turkey less less uh, democratic today than five years ago. No, uh, I would say no. Okay, recently. You know, I mean, right now we have MIT problem. Central Intelligence Agency was holding discussions, secret discussions with Kurdish terrorists. So that that was even unthinkable five years ago. 
So Turkish government is actually, you know, Negotiate. officials negotiating with uh, terrorists. That's, you know, that was unthinkable five years ago. And there are so many other things, other issues that, you know, so many, I mean, there are articles written saying that we had Armenian genocide in, in 1915 is written recently in Turkish newspapers. So this, is, this was unthinkable in, you know, f five years ago. It is, oh, it's not AK Party or, you know, it's Turkish society is becoming more democratic, more open society, and we have problems in the way, such as freedom of expression problem, but eventually we will, you know, solve these problems. Several years ago, we had this internet ban. It made everyone crazy, you know. I mean, how could we have this ban at this age of uh, time? So now we don't have that problem anymore. You know, it's it's somehow passed. You know, we have access to everything. Dennis, so, do, 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 um, yeah, I think also. I mean, it's my first time here in Washington, so I get the chance to talk to people. But I see that, you know, when when we, when people are talking about Turkey, uh, we also Turks we fall into the same trap too. Like like we think about a monolith country that there is only one, like let's say AKP government in Turkey. I mean, it's not only the government itself, but it's the whole Turkish society. So. I mean, we need to look at the things from different perspectives uh, as well. I mean, I know that it's quite uh, difficult to understand things in detail. It's not that easy. But uh, for my part, for example, during my conversation, that's why I wanted to talk about the internet, because it's quite important. Because it's how we define uh, you know, our, our, our communication. And, and that's why, um, you know, in a country with so many internet users, you know, that we are so open to, to the world, we can learn things. We can see things. We can communicate with people. It's just now that too hard to to get get back from that trend. It's just too hard. Maybe there might be some you know stops. There might be some pauses. You know, depending on the politics. You know, politics. Uh, it's a different area. But the whole trend. I mean, we need to look at the bigger picture. When we look at the big, big bigger picture, I see a, a, a positive change actually. You know, and looking at those. Mr. Bama, on, on, on that on that, she's right on one subject because of the suspension of. Uh, EU process, uh, <coughs> the reformation process slowed down incredibly. We are talking about changing the constitution, but nobody sure it's going to happen. Or we are talking Shh. about so many things, but nothing happens. It's the same, we are talking about Kurdish issue, but we are, nowadays uh, we try to solve it through the judiciary. But we are also criticizing government. We are writing, talking on televisions. It's not just uh, Erdogan decides that he wants to solve mm -hmm. Kurdish problem through arresting some Kurds or putting them into jail. Th that's not the case. We are questioning, criticizing, and uh, people at least uh, have a say how to solve this Kurdish problem. And according to the last survey, majority of Turkish people support a negotiated solution to this PKK problem. That's simple. So, sir, you had a question over here? Thank you, sir. I'm Hikmet Hajizadeh. I'm from Azerbaijan. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I have, uh, we are closely watching what's going on in Turkey. So, the <coughs> about Turkish democracy and new situation, that democracy needs checks and balance. Who is a balance for AKP now? It is my first question. Second question, last year I read about the results of opinion, national opinion poll in Turkey that 70% of Turkish women now wearing scarf. Is that true? And the last question is uh, about the internet. What is the content contents of conversation in these uh, networks? About what these young people speak? Because you can speak there about your yes. Everybody have telephones and computers, but speak about not very democratic things. Thank you. Okay, about 70% of women wearing a scarf. That's very close to reality. I think it was 65% according to TESEF. But that's been more, I mean, that's not a new thing. It's Turkish society, generally. I mean, that's the percentage. And about 15% of, um, of these women wear new style, you know. I see. And 
about one and a half and two percent of whom wear chadar, you know, wha what's called chadar, charshaf. <laughs> and that is the numbers on that. And what was the... It had a question which I thought was interesting. Was wh What is the counterbalance to the AK party? Where, where is the opposition? It, he does seem rather dominant. <laughs> okay, you have a very good question here. We should have an opposition party which is out there to get votes from the people. But since our main opposition party had this ideological stance, you know, he, that's always in between the people's values and very, where they stand. So they have difficulty getting more than 20, 25% of the votes. So we should have an opposition party which should go after 40%, 50% of the vote. And we have, you know, recently we have the people themselves and with their uh, technological devices make a good balance and, you know, they can react. And of course, we should have a strong judiciary and other things. And you mentioned the internet. Yeah, I mean, you asked me what we are, well, we are talking about everything. <laughs> um, uh, I use Twitter. Uh, I also have a Facebook account, but like, no, let's talk. When, if we think about Twitter, I mean, we, 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 we talk about everything that you can imagine. Like, I know, don't you have some survey? Uh, no, we don't have any special survey, but you know, when we look at these <coughs> trending uh, topics, for example, on Twitter, sometimes you can see that, uh, that the Turkish community is talking about a singer, but at the same time, that is also, that's why I wanted to give the example of the one earthquake, because it's not only people talking nonsense things or gossips or like, artists or like you know, celebrities but this is also changing our society that's why you know we used to say where is the state but now we say where are the corporations where are the companies and there is a, a, an important example as well a few months mm -hmm. ago we had this terrible incident in Ulud Uludere it's in the on the southeast border of Turkey where 34 people were accidentally I mean bombed you know uh, and the first we don't know if it I mean excellent. yes but like you know uh, <laughs> The, the first uh, platform that we learned about it was on Twitter. It was not TVs, not newspapers, not... not because there was a censorship, well, actually, on the part of why, news yes, media. That's why, that's why, I mean, where, where, the, where the conventional media lacks, there is a social media. That's what I was trying to say, you know? Uh, so, uh, so it's not a thing that, that things can be, are, can be hidden forever. It's like, we are all journalists now. I have, I have a question out here in the back, and if anyone in the roomy form can tell me how long I should go with this, because um, we're already over a lot of time, I think, but uh, I'll take a question from this man. My name is Baichim, and I am working as a producer at Abroad TV. My question is about almost every day we are seeing an article or uh, opposite editorial. Uh, investor media, they're concerned about the, how bad uh, press of freedom in Turkey. So uh, I want to focus on one of the article recently published in Washington Post. Uh, so uh, it's about the uh, opposi opposition party leader. Uh, he was saying over than hundreds of the uh, journalists and uh, politi polit politician academics uh, detained it just because of the opposition of the AK party. And he is... Uh, Further portraying Turkey, uh, portraying Turkey, a country where people live in fear. Uh, this is, I think, very important. Uh, as a journalist living in Turkey, is that true? Uh, it was unthinkable for a Turkish political party leaders ten, five years ago, writing in a foreign newspaper complaining about the situation in Turkey. Everybody will call you a traitor. It was the political atmosphere. You couldn't. It, it might be true, but you couldn't talk about it to the foreigners or write about about it in a foreign newspaper. So, I mean, uh, I don't agree with Mr. Kılıçdaroğlu, and by believe what most of what he wrote to Washington Post is false. But just being able to write this kind of articles in that atmosphere is important by itself. Uh, we might sometimes might get disturbed what they write in the Western media, but we get used to it. Otherwise, we need critics. We need to turn and back the situation in Turkey. If it's true, 108 journals are in prison, it's a bad situation. If it's 50, it's still a bad situation. So uh, through this criticism, if it's uh, real, 
uh, friendly criticism, we should take it seriously and uh, turn back to Turkey and try to correct things. Uh, not just complain about it, they are criticizing Turkey, they are saying bad things to us. Look at them, uh, check the situation, what it is really, and uh, do the right thing. I mean. You've, you've put the finger on exactly what the United States' uh, government's biggest concern is, and it's this. There are journalists in jail who've been held without charge for two, three years, and so we don't know if they're being held for carrying a bomb or, or for writing critically against the president. And that's what worries, I think, the international community is. They're not coming, they're not getting their day in court so we can judge, uh, you know, uh, from the outside whether there's something to these charges. If we, we get frank, uh, if you see a threat as a state, you take all precautions. You did the same thing in Guantanamo. Uh, Guantanamo. Guantanamo. You kept people for so many years. You Shamefully, still, I'll add. Yeah, <laughs> tortured and so many things happened in there. We know it. And, but uh, when it comes to Turkey, it's not true. They, people know what they are accused of. Uh, let's say Mustafa Balbay, Tunjay Özkan and other uh, journalists are in prison. Uh, Mustafa Balbay's diary was found in his computer. Uh, it's telling about how he, every day nearly, he went to the uh, headquarters of the military and talked to the generals what they should do, what he is going to do. But no day do. in court, no day in court for his, his own side to be told by his lawyer, so we could all judge. No, he's uh, being he's in trial. It's, uh, there is every day the, uh, a session in the court. It's one of the fastest cases in Turkish history. Probably this summer is going to have a verdict about the case. Okay. Sometimes they are, it's, a, it's not uh, good to keep people three years in prison, but that's the uh, general problem for Turkish courts, not just unique for this case. And on the, on the Guantanamo analogy, first off, a lot of criticism, a lot of people like myself believe it's absolutely shameful what's going on there. We're not keeping American citizens in Guantanamo, that's the, that's the key difference. Um, last question, because I, I have to wind this up. Um, I see a man in the back row there. Uh, Mohammed Nimr, I teach uh, Islam and World Affairs at American University. Uh, Mr. Babahan raised uh, questions uh, about the, uh, the structure of ownership and uh, the uh, limitation of uh, uh, editorial independence. Uh, you said that uh, ed editorials usually reflect the ownership of, uh, of the media. Yeah, well, that's in the U.S. that's called freedom of the press. I mean, and, and this, is the, this is the practice, uh, this is a very common practice here. And so why, why do you think that limits uh, that's a limitation of, uh, of uh, editorial freedom. Plus, uh, you said uh, there are national newspapers. Are they, are they paid and funded by the government? No. They're not. Uh, are there uh, newspapers or media, major media outlets uh, funded by the government? No. TRT? Okay. Ah. Uh, yeah. TRT only TRT. So what is uh, I this? Did, uh, I'm totally thinking about the press. Um, so what is the structure? The, the question about the structure of ownership <coughs> and uh, its relationship to uh, editorial independence. Let me answer. You can clarify. Yeah, let me answer what he meant. Uh, actually, I don't agree with some of the things uh, he said. But what he meant is. Some people, some businessmen, get into media business just to have advantage in terms of bargaining with the governments. That's what he meant, right? So they are into media so that they could have advantage against their rivals in the in the let's say another sector, so that they could put pressure on politics. That's been the case for many many years, but. You know, if you are a columnist and you, are, if you are a popular in a newspaper, you, if you have a follower, I mean, the boss would keep you there no matter what. <coughs> but if you say the wrong things and you know get criticism, not necessarily from the government or from the authorities, if you are a bad writer, boss would h fire you, and most probably you would go out and say, "Hey, they fired me because I was critical of this or that or government and so on." But as a cartoonist, let me tell you something that I experienced in one of the meetings about 10 years ago in American Cartoonist Society, Editorial Cartoonist Society. We had uh, you know, so many cartoonists listening, and we had speakers, a panel of editors who decide who are the editors of the cartoonists. So one cartoonist asked, so what is a good cartoonist for you? 
and editor said the good cartoonist is the one who okayed his pencil sketch to me and then gave come back with the exactly the same cartoon without changing it now that's unthinkable for me or for many Turkish cartoonists because I am the last minute I submit my work last minute I've been doing that for 25 years and nobody edited so far or nobody told me that you change this you change that and he was my editor-in-chief and he never said that sometimes afterwards he come and said you know he, oh, that cartoon was terrible but you know <laughs> that, I mean but that's something else you know uh, I have the responsibility to my audience. If they didn't like my cartoon in the long term, I know that I would lose my job. But, you know, that's in terms of editorial uh, freedom comparison between American cartoonists and Turkish cartoonists. And if I could just add on the American side, I mean, we had a period in the early 1900s called yellow journalism where very much this dynamic <laughs> ruled the media, where everyone who owned a paper really did it for, to push a political or ideological agenda. It was not uh, particularly looked back on with, uh, with favor as a period of American journalism. Over the years, we developed standards of objectivity or, or, or at least tried to where, you know, editorial comment was in the editorial page, but what you read in the, in the front of the newspaper um, was relatively objective, and I'll use that term relatively. We are now fragmenting now because of the internet and because of the development of, of niche uh, publications. Conservatives go to Fox, the liberals go to MSNBC, so we're kind of going back there, um, and a lot of us sort of legacy journalists like myself of a certain age think it's not necessarily a good thing, but it's the reality. Anyway, if you would just give my, a hand to my uh, colleagues here for a great Presentation. And thank you so much for coming.